Ready? Yeah. Hi, good afternoon and welcome. Um, before we start this event today, I'd like to acknowledge that Kickstart, as well as Pendulum Gallery, is fortunate to exist and create on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I would also like to acknowledge that this being a digital event means we have folks joining us from other territories and lands as well. Thank you for joining us today for the virtual tour of Constructed Identities, featuring sculptures by Persimmon Blackbridge. We are thrilled to not only be presenting this exhibition, which has been years in the making, but we're also thrilled to be able to provide access to the work both in person at the Pendulum Gallery in Vancouver, but also online through this live stream, which will also be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So in order to find that, you can search for Kickstart Disability Arts and Culture on YouTube. My name is Jenna Reed. I have short brown and gray hair, I'm wearing neon yellow glasses, a black and white checked shirt, a neon pink and white striped shirt, um, and I am Kickstart's um, artistic director. So I joined Kickstart in April of 2021. I am a mad identified queer fiber artist who works primarily with the practices of quilting and natural dyes as a way to engage activist-based aesthetics. Uh, I organize specifically with psychiatric survivor community and do solidarity or cross-movement organizing with my artwork and beyond. So before we be begin this program today, we feel it's also important to acknowledge that this being a digital event, we may experience some technical difficulties but we'll do our best to move forward should something arise. For instance, there may be people walking through the gallery space as we're recording. It's a public and open space. This also means that there is some background noise. There's possible there will be interruptions. And because we're doing this as a live stream, we do not have captions for this initial event but we will be uploading, as I said before, this live stream onto our YouTube channel. And when we do that, we will provide closed captions. So now I have the pleasure of introducing you to the artist and telling you a little bit about Persimmon. For the past 45 years, Persimmon Blackbridge has worked as a sculptor, a writer, a curator, a performer, as well as being a fiction editor, a cleaning lady, and a very bad waitress. Blackbridge's pioneering contribution to queer art in Canada began with Still Sane, a 1984 collaboration with Sheila Gilhooley, inspired by the latter's three-year psychiatric incarceration for being a lesbian. In the 1990s, Blackbridge was a member of the lesbian art collective Kiss and Tell. Blackbridge has also been a seminal figure in the disability art scene from the 70s until present. Sunnybrook, A True Story with Lies is a visual art show and book about abuse in Woodlands Institution, which won New York's Pharaoh Brumley Prize. Blackbridge's most recent show, Constructed Identities, which we're going to tour through today, uses mixed media wood carving with found objects to question how disability is framed as a fracturing of ordinary life rather than a central part of it. I'm also going to introduce you to our guest curator, Yuri. Unfortunately, Yuri is not able to join us today. We were hoping it would be possible, but he's not doing so well. Um, but Yuri is a working artist who has dedicated much of his practice to advocating for fellow artists. 
including artists who live with a disability. He has founded and run a number of arts organizations and art galleries in the U.S. and in Canada over the past 20 years and is the former artistic director of Kickstart Disability Arts and Culture. So next I'm going to read you the exhibition statement and after I do that we'll move into a more relaxed walking through of the exhibit. So, as Persimmon uh, writes, I used to make art out of passion to tell a particular story. A long, complicated story, years in the telling, about when Sheila was locked up, or when I worked at Woodlands, or those long, brutal arguments about porn. By 2009, I was working on an art story about the dead bodies and political posturing of, of war. Then, my young friend, Tempest Grace Gale, was murdered. Soon after, another friend, Catherine White Holman, died in a plane crash. Then, my partner, Della, had a series of small strokes and a fall which fractured her back. Funerals and medical tests were suddenly the order of the day. My time horizon shrunk down to today. Do this day today. Today, today. Working on my art, I couldn't tell the war story anymore. Instead, it was all about what was in front of me. This piece of driftwood drowned like Tempest was drowned. These wings like Catherine falling through the sky. This hinge like Della's fractured spine. This body of work is built of overlapping splinters of meaning, meaning disability, the femme gaze, dead friends, racism, endless rain, all at once. As these things act on us all at once in our day-to-day -day lives. These layered meanings are reflected in the phrases spanning the edges of the panels, which we will lead you through. Not defining a single piece or grouping, but opening questions and evoking alternate understandings of the series as a whole. I was heavily influenced by the sculptures of Tempest Grace Gale. She made figures using junk collected from the same beaches, forest, and recycling depot where I find my junk, which she combined with gleefully deconstructed dolls. Eventually, I added wood carving to the mix of my media, and Della brought me Barbies from the recycling depot which I dismembered and remembered as Tempest had done. Barbie is excellent because she is ubiquitous and mundane. She is also in a constant state of normalized change. Changing from one set of clothes to another is her central meaning. <laughs> uh, and then I've lost myself. Yeah, in these pieces, the transformation of her body, instead of her clothes, juxtaposes normalized change with deviant change. As humans, we are always transforming from state to state. Some transformations are constructed as unremarkable. Others are seen as peculiar, disturbing, tragic, Everyone who lives long enough will become old. This change is considered natural. Everyone who lives long enough will become disabled, or disabled in a new way. This change is considered unnatural. In Western culture, disability is not accepted as a regular part of life. Society does not expect it, build around it, or embrace it within our daily lives. The unexpected construction of these figures questions the way society frames 
disability as a fracturing of ordinary life, rather than as an altogether ordinary part of it. When an artist makes a figure, it's never just a figure. Social meanings have been attached to our bodies so firmly, so relentlessly, over such a span of history, that we mistake these socio-political constructs for immutable reality. We don't see bodies, we see moral imperatives. Disability is tragedy, race is biology, and our rowdy genders are made to march in binary formation. These figures are awkward and fit together from broken parts, not because we, we people, we strange, ordinary people whose bodies defy the default are broken, but because we are human and the human condition is awkward, contradictory, stitched together from disparate pieces. The figures also reflect power and beauty, not because we have transcended our pain or in any final way freed ourselves, but because we have strength, grace and wonder, inseparable from our grief, confusion, and anger. So the rest of this tour is going to be pretty laid back. The initial plan was for Yuri and I to walk through the exhibit together, uh, providing visual descriptions of the work while also talking about our own experiences related to persimmon and the sculptures that are part of this show. Since Yuri wasn't able to join us today, this event will be slightly less conversational. Um, I have a general order of things, but really, for the most part, will be completely unscripted, and I'm just going to lead you sit through some visual descriptions of what you could see if you were here personally at the gallery. I also want to take a second to thank Kate, our administrative director and film uh, extraordinaire for doing the filming of this event and all of the other wonderful tech stuff that uh, has to happen to make this available and accessible later on our YouTube channel as well. So thank you, Kate. <laughs> I got a thumbs up. <laughs> so let's move through. We're gonna start by moving through I'm also going to pull up um, the text for the different um, pieces that we're going to look at. So I'm going to mostly stay out of view. I think it's possible for you to comment if you are in this live stream. And so if you're having difficulty hearing me, I'm not loud enough. Um, feel free to let me know and we'll see what we can do to try and make it a bit different. This is panel one and Kate is showing you the entire panel at first. The panel is uh, grayish and is square and on the bottom right hand corner on the panel as well as off the panel there is the text that says what she taught me. And if we go up to the top left corner of the panel, there is this sculpture titled Red Wing. And Red Wing is made with African Padok, Bloodwood, scrap metal, and bone. And what you see with this one is a sculpture of a figure that has a, 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 a wing-looking um, limb in place of the right arm and with a piece of red scrap metal. The sculpture is kind of floating on the panel, but in a position that seems as if it is uh, upright uh, or standing almost, even though it is not standing on anything. The toes are pointing downwards, and you can see kind of that there are uh, curves sculpted into the figure. There is, uh, you, 
you know, you have uh, scrap metal used to create a hand, and there are some joints as well as uh, wiring used to hold the different pieces together. Also, I'll give you a little moment to have a look at this. Also on this panel, as you move a little bit to the right, you see these different, um, uh, these three small different pieces. And on the furthest right is, is like a Ken doll head. And it is just from the above the eyebrows up. So you see the forehead and the hair, and the hair is kind of a beigey brown. Um, and the other pieces that are with this sculpture, uh, or with this dismembered Kendall head, is a, uh, are two other, there is what looks like uh, the redwood or perhaps another type of wood, as well as what looks like a bone type um, material. And they are kind of, uh, they're, they are in the shape of what would be similar to a head or a cranium. And when you go down, you see on the, um, the next sculpture is titled Seal, uh, His Bones. So his bones, no, sorry, we're going with seal first. <laughs> so seal is made with mahogany, seal jaw fragment, and sheet copper. And in this sculpture, which is significantly smaller than the first one we looked at, um, you see what is, uh, uh, oh, that one, we're on this one. So you see what is um, kind of uh, ribs sort of carved into where ribs might be. You see uh, a nail coming out of where genitals might be on a figure. Again, the toes are pointing downwards and the limbs seem to be made out of small pieces of bone. Then if we move over to the next sculpture, um, it's made of Hollywood, bones, wire, and paint. And this one uh, has teeth on it. So in the very middle of the sculpture, and this sculpture is slightly bigger than the one we were just looking at, um, you see a bit of a jaw. Oh, maybe this one is sealed. So this one is seal, my apologies. The first one was his bone, and this one is seal. And it has a bit of a jaw with teeth in the center of the sculpture. The arms are pointing downwards. The toes are also pointing downwards. And you see at the top of the head that the, that the cranium type part of the, um, of the sculpture is somewhat separated from the rest of the head. So we're going to move to the next panel, panel two. And the wording on this panel is relentless. So it's starting with the sculpture at, on the left of the panel, which is heart of whiteness one you have Hollywood and doll parts. And within the wood, you kind of see that it is um, either discolored or burnt. And you can see that the limbs of the sculpture are dismembered limbs from dolls. This sculpture is kind of curvy. You see that it has nice, beautifully curvy hips. And again, the cranium of this one is somewhat separated from the rest of the head. And if you keep moving on the panel, again, you see some more uh, doll heads beside wooden heads. But again, it's as if it is from that eyebrow up part. You see a little bit of hair on the doll, but it's cut off as if someone's gone to it with scissors 
and looks a little singed or matted. The next figure is beside another doll head. And the doll head definitely has had its white blonde hair cut off. And the figure beside it has long blonde, but quite white blonde, crimped as well as straight hair. This figure is Butch Femme, Butch slash Femme, and it's Hollywood, Purple Heart, Doll Parts, Plastic Spoon, and Bone. And so you can see in this figure that some of the limbs are made out of doll parts, some is made out of a plastic spoon, you have a different colored wood attached at the side of the hip, and there are kind of different elements where the sculpture seems to be uh, both kind of cut apart from itself, but also put back together. And the, the last sculpture on this panel is called His Bones Dancer. And this beautiful sculpture is sitting on a ledge uh, it is made out of black walnut, cherry, bone, and miscellaneous junk. And what you see with this one is that uh, it has a, uh, its arms are kind of almost joyfully pointing upwards. Uh, you see a center part that is a coil. And then the legs are uh, different parts of bone and other, uh, uh, other things. In this next panel, you have text both at the bottom left and the bottom right. And it says diagnosis and daily. So the top a uh, sculpture on this panel, we're on panel three, are his bones, long spine. And Persimmon, in our artist talk, discussed the ways in which she, she names work, and that is largely based on what the work is looking like or what materials she's using. So with his bones, long spine, you can see in the center of it, um, part of a, a bones that really shape to look like spine or are a piece of pieces of spine. This sculpture is also sitting on a ledge. The previous sculpture had more of an angled ledge whereas this one has a round part and a straight or rectangular ledge and it has smaller arms and then when and when the sculpture gets to kind of the knee joints down, also has bone pieces that are more slender than the curviness of the sculpture. Again, as you move over on the panel, kind of going in clockwise, you see some more doll heads um, that have been cut from the above the eyebrow up. One has short, spiky blonde hair, while the other has braided brown hair. And going down, you see Thermo. And Thermo is made out of bloodwood, mahogany, thermostat, and doll parts. And Thermo kind of has no limbs on the upper part of the body, has one continuous piece for the head, and then as you get to the bottom of the sculpture, you see that the limbs at where the legs are, are, are asymmetrical. So you have an, a piece of a doll part used for the right limb, and, a, and kind of the uh, left leg cuts off in a pointy type of way. And the last um, sculpture on this panel is a wonderfully tall and long sculpture. Its name is Sparky. And uh, again, Persimmon shared with us in the, um, in the artist talk that she gave for us, which you could check out on our YouTube channel. 
that this one is named Sparky because the hair that is used on the doll came from, if I recall correctly, a friend of uh, Persimmons. And uh, in this sculpture, what you see is a uh, yellow cedar, spruce, driftwood, doll pipes, pipe filter, and hair. And, and kind of the very interesting piece of this is that when you get down to the knees and down is the legs are, are so long and slender, exponentially longer and taller than any of the other sculptures, but also significantly long in comparison to the actual sculpture itself. It, the height of it is more than half the height of the panel. And the last panel on this side of the exhibit it, the word at the bottom left says denial. And before I go on to the panel, I'm going to have Kate kind of come back and what you see of the words, what we've covered so far, starting at the very first panel, is it says, what she taught me, relentless, diagnosis, daily, denial. And so going into this panel, we see the first uh, sculpture is titled Relay, and it is made out of teak and mahogany and electrical, uh, electrical relay. So hence the name for the sculpture Relay. And this is one of the more slender sculptures. Some of the sculptures combine both kind of curviness and slender pieces, but this one is kind of tall and slender throughout. You do see that the hip on the left side juts out in a sort of asymmetrical way. So the trunk of the body comes up directly from the right leg, whereas normally you would see a figure um, sitting in the center of the hips. As we know, there's nothing about these sculptures or this exhibit that is meant to have a sense of normal as dominant culture has us understand it. So looking at it in this way, it provides a really interesting kind of uh, view and engagement with form and figure and, and body and whatnot. Going on to the next one titled Bloodwood, Bloodwood uh, has bloodwood, scrap wire, and copper nails. And with this figure, which is the first one we've seen like this, the part of the head from the eyebrows up is not there. And there's kind of a split line that goes through the wood asymmetrically, starting at the top, going down to just below the right knee. Again, this figure's toes are pointing downwards and its arms are made out of this uh, scrap wire that seem to be curving around to the back of the sculpture. And then a lot of people's favorite sculpture within this exhibit is the Flicker sculpture. Again, it's quite a large one in comparison to the other ones on this panel. It is made of jara, what, mahogany, bird wing, bone, graphite, and electric wire. This one has a beautiful bird wing on the right hand upper limb that has kind of flicks of an orangey red throughout the throughout the feathers. And then on the other side of the sculpture, you have the wires coming out in a similar kind of shape as a wing would have. This sculpture is beautifully curvy. It has curves carved in or sculpted into the chest. The hips are nice and curvy. The thighs are beautifully thick. And then you go down to the, uh, the limbs below the knees and again you see bone being used. 
So we're gonna walk around to the other side of the exhibit. And what you do notice in this uh, exhibit is that we do have an ASL monitor if you are able to stop by in person uh, that, uh, so that you can um, uh, see the, uh, the exhibition statement. And so here we're coming around to to the next panel and on the bottom right hand corner uh, are the words, the invention. And again, I'll read to you the words with each panel and then we'll talk about how the words look like spread across the panels. Um, so what we have here is this sculpture, uh, What She Gave Me. Again, What She Gave Me is one of the larger sculptures in this exhibit, and it is made of yellow cedar, red cedar, maple, doll parts, and miscellaneous junk. In this sculpture, you see quite a lot of mixture of wood. And while one of the doll parts used for the right hand, kind of at just above the wrist down, is uh, looks like a Barbie hand, but one with a joint, which is unusual. So the wrist has a joint in it. And below that you see a doll leg that is significantly bigger than what a Barbie doll would be. So this looks more like it's a, like a child's kind of baby doll leg. And here you see the sculpture only has one arm. The baby doll leg is sort of dangling, um, attached by a wire, but inside the hollow part of the leg. And the leg, the legs kind of are curving into one another, making a bowed sort of shape. Next, we have Liminal Barbie One. And I quite love this sculpture. Um, if you go right in close, what you can see is this very skull-like, uh, somewhat menacing uh, face that is carved into the sculpture. And this sculpture is made out of common two by four scrap metal, doll parts, feathers, and wax. So you can see within this one, the feathers are attached to the arm as if they're kind of coming uh, one at a time off the arm, going sort of back backwards. So if the sculpture were to be animated and move its arms outwards, you would see the, the feathers kind of going backwards as opposed to in the shape that, say, feathers on a bird might take shape. You have a very small head on this one. You have Barbie arms for both arms. And then again, you have the, these legs that have beautifully thick thighs and toes that are pointing downwards. You can also really tell the difference with this common two by four, as opposed to some of the other wood that's used in the sculpture in terms of uh, the color of the wood, which is pretty light. It's not, it, it doesn't have many markings on it. So you can see the grain of the wood, but there's no discoloration significantly apart from some knots. Again, you have two more, uh, what, I, what, I see, what I see as cranial type sculptures that lead you to the, the, the next sculpture on this panel, which is Sir Form. And it's made out of holly, mahogany, padauk, bone, ironwood, and miscellaneous junk. And so this one is um, made in a way where you see sort of staple-like figures 
attaching near the hip bones the one um, element of the sculpture with the other. And the, the foot on one of the legs is a significantly kind of darker red wood than what is the main part of the body. You have a different material used for the, uh, the cranium of the sculpture than is for the head or the face area. And you see some scrap metal right in the center of the chest, as well as a bone coming out for the left arm with no hand or any other kind of features at the end of that one. On the next panel, the words on the bottom left are of whiteness, and on the bottom right are what he. And we have three sculptures. We have Liminal Barbie 2, Cedar Wings, and Post Red. So Liminal Barbie 2, again, has common 2x4, driftwood, doll parts, burn sheet, uh, metal, and paint. And this sculpture's limbs are raised upwards, which I think is the first sculpture that we've seen like this so far. And the arms kind of go upwards uh, with the hands uh, coming from dismembered Barbie parts. And you see that the hair is both cut off as well as braided and it's blonde. The scrap metal looks as if it is kind of a hollow, empty cavity of a chest and the scrap metal is somewhat in the shape of ribs. And then you go down again with kind of details of the carved out belly button and the kind of, uh, there's sculpted genitalia within many or most of the sculptures that you see, just a hint of it. And then again, it goes down with curvy hips and then very, very slender below the knee limbs. And again, we have some more uh, wood as well as Barbie uh, cranium sculptures, the hair with this one in the center uh, sculpture or the, the one that comes from a piece uh, from a dismembered Barbie has kind of blonde, highlighted, ashy hair uh, and it is short but straight and kind of is combed backwards. And then you have the sculpture Cedar Wings, which is yellow cedar, junk metal, feathers, and wire. And here the feathers are used um, in place of uh, the limbs or the arms at the top of the sculpture. Again, this uh, sculpture is uh, one of the neat things about this piece is it's kind of square and wide in its torso. It doesn't have the top of its cranium. In the genital area, it has um, little nails coming out kind of in the pubic area, which gives it some texture. And the, the feet are both pointing the same ways towards the left of the panel. And then at the top, you have a tiny little sculpture. And this one is post red with bloodwood, miscellaneous junk metal, and copper rod. And this tiny little sculpture, um, it has its arms raised up, but different from many of the other sculptures. It, the arms are not attached as separate pieces, but seem to be carved right into this one piece of wood. And the one piece of wood has an overlay of what I believe is the miscellaneous junk metal. But apart from that, the top piece of the top torso is all one piece. And then you go down and while the sculptures are all floating in this kind of liminal space, it is 
it's it, the way that it's positioned appears as if it is in a seated position and its limbs at the bottom so again the 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 body uh the main part of sort of the hips and the bottom area is carved out of one piece with a piece of metal over top but then attached to the knee where knee joints might be you see little scrap pieces of metal and then on this next panel, we have the words at the bottom right that say left me. So before I describe these sculptures, I'm going to have Kate zoom out again and I'll read you the words as if you were reading them all together on panel on the panels. So the words that go across the bottom of the panels, which are not necessarily supposed to be read together, but just in case that's how you visually might have taken it in while you were here in person, the words across the bottom go, the invention of whiteness, what he left me. So we'll go in closely to this panel. Uh, and the first sculpture is called Common. Common is uh, uh, made by Common 2x4, which is likely where the name comes from based on what Persimmon described to us. There is bone and driftwood as well as plastic. And if you look very closely in the center chest of this one, the plastic that you're seeing at least to what my understanding is, looks like a hearing aid, a part of a hearing aid. The battery part where you switch it on and off that would hook around the back of your ear and where you could also adjust the volume. It's very close in color, so kind of a, um, I guess a, a brownie beige. Uh, color. Uh, as you hear me kind of pausing and stopping, I'm looking at Kate for affirmation. Um, but it's very close in color to both the bones and the wood used in this sculpture. And uh, you see that the shoulders and head uh, or neck and up to what where maybe your nose might be on your face uh, should you have a nose is uh, one piece of uh, one piece of carving and that's where the head kind of ends and then as you go down you have kind of a rectangular shaped torso not too curvy pretty pretty straight which still has a notch at the belly button which is fairly consistent with most but not all of the sculptures and then slender limbs, both for the arms and the legs. Some is bone, so it looks as if both arms are bone, while the uh, limbs for the legs are driftwood, I believe. Next, we have another uh, seated sculpture titled Red Flyer. Red Flyer has puddock and feathers. And this one is interesting because it has a very, very kind of elongated and skinny torso and very, very tiny wings affixed at the shoulders. Then when you come back, you see that the sculpture is seated on a, um, a ledge, a cantilever ledge, I have been told. <laughs> by Yuri. Uh, a little shout out to Yuri for that. And also what I find really beautiful about this piece is the way that the limbs are rounded at the end. So they, they seem as if they stop uh, short for a full, leg, le full length leg. They don't have feet but they're beautifully rounded at the end. And again, this is another sculpture that only has part of the head. And then the last one on this panel is Cherry Curve. And we love Cherry Curve. Well, we love all of them. It's really impossible to 
pick a favorite, but we definitely love Cherry Curve. And Cherry Curve is figured cherry, spalted cherry, dull part, and brass rod. And Cherry Curve really lives up to its name in that it has throughout the entire figure, um, uh, which a lot of the figures do, which is a really beautiful element of Persimmon's work, but these very kind of curvy elements, curvy hips, um, you see that it works with the grain of the wood. So there's a lot of kind of um, circular grain that seems to be mimicking or working with the curves that are also carved into the sculpture. You see that there's a different um, carved piece for the head and at the neck there is kind of a joint holding it on or in there. On the right arm you have a doll arm that is facing outwards and on the left arm you have a, a, a pretty long and slender carved arm with just three fingers at the bottom and with cherry curve it's just at about the hip or just below the hip at the thighs where the sculpture gets new pieces that become the leg parts and the legs on cherry curve are kind of in this uh, the, they're facing the right and the right leg or the right foot is just a little bit higher at about the calf level of the left leg. So arm is open, palm is out, and legs are in this kind of, uh, this, this this way that kind of shows you a little bit of movement in these sculptures that appear as if they are floating and dancing and sitting and existing in these ways, hung in this way. Um, this is the way that the exhibit gets hung when it's shown that gives you a very um, kind of magical sense of engaging with the figures. So we're coming to the last panel of the exhibit. And at the bottom left of the panel is the words, on the panel it says, how she, and below the panel it says, sang. So all together it says, how she sang. And the first sculpture on this panel is titled, Dance. And dance is made out of yellow cedar, bones, wings, and oil pastel. And again, you have these wings that have this beautiful bright orange color to them with some brown as well. The legs on this are almost crossed, just one leg kind of almost crossed over the other. The wings are pointed downwards. Again, you have kind of the notches cut at the belly button as well as down in the genital area. And my favorite is kind of the curviness of the hips and the butt area of the sculptures. Next you have uh, two more, one dark wood as well as one light wood, um, kind of upper part of head sculptures. And then you have um, the sculpture Contingent Center, which is made out of driftwood, black walnut, branch, miscellaneous junk. And this one has um, a, a, an interesting part of this is that you really have quite a significant amount of the junk that's creating the part of the body or the middle torso, which makes it long and slender appearing. And then you come down to the driftwood, which has this beautiful knot in the center of the hip area. 
that the spine kind of goes down into. And then you have one piece of wood that's quite angular for the, for the left leg. And the driftwood makes part of the right leg, which gives it this, this uh, kind of angled in appearance. And then a, a piece of a, uh, like a branch, which then gives you a bent knee looking element to this sculpture. And then the last sculpture we have, which I think I could safely say is the tallest one of the whole exhibit, is Mistaken Identity, which is made out of driftwood, padauk, yellow cedar, acrylic paint, and scrap metal. And so the way it's positioned on the panel is that the arms extend above the pa panel and you see that each hand from the wrist upwards is carved separately and attached to um, branch, you know, slender branch type of driftwood. And that goes right down into the hips. It's attached to the body and yet you also see that it roots itself in the hips of the sculpture. You see a different type of wood for the top of the cranium and I and then which is a lighter brown and then a darker red wood uh, uh, the, like a red toned wood uh, that is um, used for the torso you see some some scrap metal in the center of the torso as well as right in the pubic area and some coils that are kind of wrapped right from the torso around the right leg just above the knee and then around the left leg to go in front of the ankle to behind the foot and this sculpture you can see is at an angle so it's as if it's kind of um, the way the feet look pointing downwards and the arms are stretched tall up high, uh, it's as if it's taking off in this kind of floating type of style. So that is the end of our virtual tour of the exhibit. There is some other text on the wall, so what you see here is the, what I was describing to you, the titles of the work as well as what um, materials are used. And then there is some, uh, some text about the words used within the exhibit. So I'm just gonna finish off by reading this text to you, and then we'll close out with some thank yous. So about the words, the phrases straddling the panels mean whatever you want them to mean. They are evocative rather than informative. Their purpose is to suggest, not define. But if you want to know what they mean for me, they are some of the ideas, people, conditions, and events that I thought about while making this work. What she taught me. Tempest. She comes first because the construction of every figure remembers her. Relentless diagnosis. Diagnosis is such a strange, complicated thing to be on the receiving end of. When I got my very first diagnosis of learning disabled, it was fabulous. It meant the stuff I regularly been beaten for in my young life was not my fault after all. But actually, I don't believe in learning disabilities. It's a label that sets apart and medicalizes certain cognitive styles. A more recent misdiagnosis led to the partial destruction of my kidneys because it was so much easier to believe a crazy person such as myself was just crazy in a new way rather than looking further. Carrying a diagnosis means you bear the burden of doubt, your feelings, your words, your experience, all are questioned. 
You are judged incompetent socially and sometimes legally. You have been exiled to the realm of the irrational. Your stories are but symptoms. Distant hands. Kidney failure comes with a flock of comorbidities. Peripheral neuropathy is my most recent damage to the nerves in the extremities, which I think about in the studio when I drop my chisel. The invention of whiteness. I think about race while I'm carving. How can I not pick pine, mahogany, walnut, holly, spruce, cedar, and there is a racialized narrative tweaking the hem of my white privilege, so there's no pretending it's not about race. I chose the name whiteness in particular here in order to disrupt its position as the default, assumed, invisible, and unquestioned. In white supremacist societies such as Canada, people of color are racialized. Race is seen as being about people of color, while white people are just seen as people. And their race is not spotlighted, interrogated, and problematized. I'm trying to momentarily interrupt that by naming whiteness and letting all other colors be the unquestioned default. Daily denial. Sometimes it seems like achieving the practicalities of daily life are only possible if one blocks out 90% of reality. Or is that just me? How she sang. Tempest, she was a sculptor, writer, performance poet, adventurer, and stilt walker, but mainly she was a singer. You carry your scars on the inside, she sang. Battlefield within. I carry my scars on the outside, all over my skin. Note, many pieces in this series are titled His Bones. They are an homage to artist and disability activist Jeff McMurchie, who has been an influence on my work for decades. He and I shared a junk aesthetic, reveling in the beauty of things. Our culture throws away things seen as useless, broken, a conscious metaphor for the lives of people with disabilities, after his death in 2015, I was given bones from his collection and have used them in his bones. An ongoing series within the larger project, Constructed Identities. So Persimmon Blackbridge's Constructed Identities is on here at the Pendulum Gallery in Vancouver from July 26th to August 20th. So we are just coming to the end. We're really glad that you joined us for this live stream and perhaps are watching this on YouTube. Um, we have been thrilled to work with Persimmon and guest curator Yuri. And we also want to have a little special thank you to Della. Uh, Persimmon's partner who did an excellent amount of work in hanging um, and other elements of kind of making this exhibit uh, actually materialize for us at the Pendulum Gallery. We're also so excited to finally have this exhibit in Vancouver so close to where Persimmon is and really at the heart of some of the spaces um, that Persimmon it talks about in terms of her relationships with disability activism, psychiatric survivor activism, and specifically disability arts and culture. So thank you for joining us um, and we hope to see you at future programming with Kickstart.